Welcome to Marketplace Tech Bytes, our look at the week that was in tech. I'm your host, Matt Levin. This week on the show, Google pays Apple 36% of Safari search revenue. It's a lot. Meta strikes a deal to return to China after more than a decade in the wilderness, and how cyber attacks can disrupt industries across the board. I'm joined by one of our regular contributors, Anita Ramaswamy, who's a columnist at Reuters Breaking Views. How are you doing, Anita? I'm doing well, Matt. It's great to be on. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, we're going to start this episode with the Marketplace Tech Bite of the Week, which is a number that very elegantly and conveniently uh, summarizes one of the big stories in tech. Anita, do you have a number for me? I do. And you already said it. It's 36%, um, which is the percent of revenue that Google shares with Apple every time somebody does a Google search on an Apple device. It's an amazing kickback. Um, that is a perfect segue to our uh, first headline, which is that 36% figure that you just referenced here. Um, of all the ad revenue Google generates when someone uses its search engine on Safari, the fact that a third of it goes to Apple was the most recent revelation in the Google antitrust trial, which seems to be the gift that keeps on giving to tech journalists. Yeah. Um, it was already reported that Google paid $18 billion annually to Apple to be the default search engine um, in Safari, which is a lot. And this is just yet another statistic that shows um, how deep this relationship is between these two tech giants. And the best part of it is that this number wasn't supposed to come out, right? This number yeah, was- Yeah, it's kind of juicy. I, I think, um, you know, Google and Apple, it was reported, were trying really hard to keep this number a secret. And the way it ended up slipping out was during witness testimony by a uh, University of Chicago professor, Kevin Murphy. And, you know, it had been previously reported, like you mentioned, Matt, about that 18 billion. And it's not clear whether this 36% is above and beyond that in addition to it. But either way, we're talking tens of billions of dollars. And just having such a key detail of that arrangement between Apple and Google was really material in the trial. I'm, I'm curious how you think about this relationship between Google and Apple now, like these incredibly powerful frenemies and who <laughs> has the power between them. I mean, it's really a mutually beneficial deal for both of them. But I would say if there's one entity that's benefiting a little bit more, it might even be Apple because that revenue is super important to them. I mean, the fact that they're getting such a large cut of it, basically, if you, I mean, Google is paying Apple to be the default search engine on all Apple devices. Apple had an executive come on earlier in the trial at EQ, and his argument was essentially that well, you know, Google is, it's the best search engine. So he sort of, he didn't say mm -hmm. this directly, but he implied like we would sort of use it anyway. But I don't know, I, I, I am questioning, is that really true insofar as Google is paying tens of billions of dollars to Apple? And for Apple, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big chunk of money. They're getting tens of, billion tens of billions of dollars. And if you assume that most of that is coming to Apple in the form of profit, I mean, it's, it's a significant chunk of Apple's valuation. It seems to me that the most um, damning evidence that this is anti-competitive behavior is the sheer amount of money that Google pays. Like, I almost feel like Lena Khan could just kind of, not that she's personally involved in this trial, but she could just literally go to the witness stand and just say, 18 billion, we're done here. Yeah, well, it's like if really the reason that Apple's putting Google as its default is that it's the best product, then Google wouldn't need to pay Apple to convince them to do it. And that was the argument we heard earlier from Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft. He came on and he was yeah. sort of advocating earlier for Bing. And he was like, well, you know, if Bing was the search engine that was default on all Apple devices, he argued they would have a lot more users. Um, do you have a prediction as to how this antitrust trial ends? It's a good question. <laughs> it's sort of dragged on. Um, you know, I honestly don't think that it looks too great for Google, but the question is more... It's not so much whether they'll be ruled against. It's more so, you know, if they are ruled against, what is going to be the extent of the damages that they'll have to pay or the consequences that'll be imposed? So my understanding is right now the state is sort of wrapping up its argument, but 
They haven't decided yet whether they're going to have closing arguments now, whether they're going to have closing arguments in the spring. Um, and it's already been, I think, going on for like eight weeks or so. So it's it's um, it's going to be a slow slog before we get any answers, I think. Yeah, slog seems like the uh, buzzword of the moment <laughs> for antitrust. Okay, let's move on to our second headline of the week, which takes a look at yet another company that has been in the crosshairs of the FTC. Um, Meta has struck a deal to return to China. Uh, so amid maybe a thaw in U.S.-China tensions, Meta um, has struck a preliminary deal with the Chinese company Tencent, which is a huge tech giant in China that also uh, does a bunch of video games. Uh, it is the first time Meta is returning to China in 14 years after Facebook was banned there in 2009. Instagram and WhatsApp are also disallowed in China um, this deal is about uh, virtual reality headsets. So uh, uh, meta virtual reality headsets, those Oculus headsets will be for sale in China, maybe assuming the Chinese government approves this deal uh, starting next year. Um, Anita, what do you make of this deal? It's still a preliminary deal. So I do want to be careful to, you know, jump to any conclusions, you know, it, yeah. it could still very much be banned and all of that. But it's really, really huge because for 14 years, Meta has essentially not operated at all in the Chinese market. And I think it's really interesting that they're choosing to go about this through VR headsets specifically, because a lot of the tension between US tech companies and the US and China in general is around these issues of things like censorship and free speech mm -hmm. and some of those like thornier issues that if you're running a social media platform, you got to think about those things. I think that there's some potential for that kind of thing going on with VR headsets, but their main use case is gaming. It seems a little more like uncontroversial. It seems like a bit more of an easy way to re-enter the Chinese market. And they're doing it through sharing revenue too with Tencent, which is a local company. Tencent's going to make revenue um, from the content and Meta is going to keep most of the device revenue, I believe is what the journal reported. And so if that's really the way it shakes out, I mean, there could be a massive market opportunity for Meta to unlock there. And they already do make some revenue in China, weirdly. That was another thing that I, I sort of learned while reporting on this. Well what do they make money off of in China now? Yeah. So even though they've been banned, they make money there from Chinese advertisers paying them money to basically advertise in other countries. And yeah. Meta's CFO actually mentioned this on their last earnings call last month. And she specifically said a big reason why they saw ad revenue growth overall was because China did really well for them in the last quarter. Can you give us a general update on Meta's quest, I guess, pun intended, for the metaverse? Yeah, this is one of Mark Zuckerberg's big initiatives that investors didn't really love. And Reality Labs, it's the division that he is spinning these headsets out of, yeah. has been losing like tens of billions of dollars every single year. And, you know, they're still losing money from everything that we've seen so far publicly reported. It's a pretty ambitious project and sales have just sort of started. Um, and the, the version they're going to be selling in China would be a cheaper version. Yeah. So it's possible that that'll gain a bit more traction. But I think we're still really in the early stages and they haven't taken off in a big way or anything like that. And and what I've been hearing sort of anecdotally is that the content available on the Quest is pretty limited. So you haven't seen a huge influx of, you know, developers going and getting their games mm -hmm. on there. Um, you know, that might be because Meta is not approving apps quickly enough. It might be because developers aren't interested in putting games for the Quest. But I think in order for them to really take off and reach sort of mass adoption or, or widespread usage, there's going to have to be fun games to play and a bunch of different ways to use the headset. So it's not just about the hardware. It's also about the software. Five years from now, Anita, if you had to bet <laughs> um, when we drag you back here to do Marketplace Tech Bytes, will we both be wearing Oculus headsets and communicating that <laughs> way as opposed to this Zoom or StreamYard, I suppose? I don't know. I've actually done VR gaming before and I thought it was really it's, fun, but I don't I see it good. more of like a gaming thing than like an everyday thing. I don't know that I'd want to put a VR headset on and like like it's fine. I can see you. You know, I don't need to see your whole physical body in 3D so that we can have this conversation. Yes, <laughs> or some weird vaguely Nintendo S avatar. That's the thing with these yeah. VR headsets is I did a story um on this where they sent me one and I played around with it oh, and fine. the actual gaming. Yeah, it is. It's like, Oh wow, this is really good. And it it somewhat surprises me that at least in the gaming sector, this hasn't taken off as much as perhaps I naively thought it might have. 
It's clunky. And that's why I thought it was interesting. Mm. Meta had an event recently where they unveiled like this Ray-Ban sort of sunglass dupe that is powered by AI. I I think something like that could be like a little easier to use. You're not putting on like a really chunky headset. They're also still pretty expensive. I mean, Apple's version is even more expensive than Meta's, but I do think the price point might have to come down before people get really excited about using something like this. Yeah, if it was a hundred bucks instead of five hundred bucks, I think that makes a huge, huge difference. Exactly. Um, okay, let's move on to our last headline of the week: uh, How cyber attacks are disrupting industries across the board. This is probably the most terrifying headline of the three we've talked about. Yeah. Um, the the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, a big, big, big big bank in China is still recovering from an attack by the Russian uh, ransomware group Lockbit. Most troubling, at least perhaps for financial journalists, is that this meant that this Chinese bank couldn't clear U.S. Treasury trades, which if you know anything about the global financial system, the U.S. Treasury market needs to stay liquid, like for the health of everything. You need to be able to clear these trades. So, um, Anita, obviously, this isn't the most, uh, this isn't the only ransomware attack that has happened of late. Could you put this attack in context for us? Absolutely, Matt. Um, ICBC is actually the world's largest lender, and it was their US division that got hit. So it's it's a really big deal. But, you know, setting that aside, we've seen a couple other cyber attacks in the past few months. We saw MGM and Caesars, like the two casino resort hotel chains, got both attacked. They both handled that in different ways. Um, Caesars reportedly paid a ransom to the hackers, whereas MGM had their systems down for about 10 days. They were working really hard to recover their data and recover access to their systems, but mm-hmm. it hit them really hard. We we saw an attack at Clorox recently that had a really big impact on Clorox's financial results because it hit their supply chain and their ability to manufacture certain products. So this has become really like a widespread sort of epidemic in the past few years, really. Um, what is a company supposed to do when they get hit with a ransomware attack? And what does the Biden administration think they should do? So the Biden administration is not a fan of companies paying ransoms. And the reason behind that is a lot of these ransomware attackers are located in countries that it's really hard to prosecute them for something illegal, like Russia Mm. or North Korea or places that the U.S. doesn't really have good relationships. And so part of the Biden administration's concern is like originally they were actually considering banning companies from paying ransoms at all. Um, And now they have decided to lead this coalition of 40 different countries that are all agreeing if the country's governments get hacked by a ransomware attacker, that they won't pay the ransoms. That's an agreement that just got announced uh, about two weeks ago. It's not inked yet, but that's what the Biden administration is thinking about doing. Is that going to (laughs) work? That's the that's the tough question, right? When you're a government, it's easy to say, look, we don't want to do business with essentially, you know, bad actors. We don't want to do business and fund these groups because once the groups get more funding, they just use it to launch more attacks. It's a really profitable business for them. And ransomware attacks in particular are just almost impossible for a company to prevent. Like you have to keep updating your software. All these companies use so many different types of software. There's tons of different points of vulnerability. And so when companies actually get hit, a lot of times, you know, they might feel like paying the ransom is the only way to get their systems back. I mean, if you look at MGM, they refused to pay the ransom. They lost 10 days worth of revenue. Like for 10 days, nobody was going into their casinos or hotels. No new guests were checking in. They didn't have access to core systems. And they really lost out because of that. So from the perspective of a CEO of a company, you would hope that the company has a good contingency plan in place. But a lot of companies just simply don't because it's so complicated to have your data backed up somewhere else and like fix the problem yourself. So what happens is these ransomware attackers basically hack into a company system. They say, okay, you can't access your system unless you pay us like, you know, X sum of money. And if you pay us, we're going to give you a key to decrypt your system. And for companies to do that themselves is really tough. So oftentimes they might feel like, well, the only option we have is really to pay the ransom, which just like Mm -hmm. fuels the problem. It, it seems like there's just no good answers there. Um, okay. Um, I think that's it. Thank you so much, Anita, for joining us. You were fantastic. 
Thank you. It was great to be here. It was super fun having you on. Thanks to all of you for joining us for Marketplace Tech Bytes, your uh, week in review in the world of tech. Jesus Alvarado produced this episode. Daisy Palacios is our super producer. And I was your host, Matt Levin. Thanks again. <laughs> <laughs>